Venerable Mahasanga, distinguished guests, and dear friends in the Dhamma. I would like to begin by, I think, Venerable Arya <laughs> You come first. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always nice to start with my mistakes. <laughs> Good evening to you all. Most honorable members of the Mahasangha, Your Excellency, Amari Vijay Vardhana, the High Commission of Sri Lanka to the United Kingdom, this morning help, the President of the Buddhist society, uh, still guests and the devotees of the London Buddhist Vihara. Welcome to the annual Founders Day celebration at the London Buddhist Vihara. Since you know the scenario of the celebrations without taking much of your time, may I kindly and respectfully invite the most venerable Bobuda Sila Vimaranayaka Thera, the head monk of the London Buddhist Vihara, and the chief Sanganayaka of the Great Britain to welcome you all and to introduce uh, today's main speaker, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Harris. Thank you. <coughs> Once again, good evening. Very well, Mahal Sangha. Distinguished guests and dear friends in the Dhamma. I would like to begin by welcoming you all here in this afternoon to celebrate the 153rd anniversary of the birth of our great founder, Anagarika Dhammapada, who apart from founding this Vihara in 1926, <coughs> was a seminal figure not only in the history of Sri Lanka, but also in the transmission of the Dhamma to the Western world. To help us celebrate the life of this great man, we are indeed fortunate to have with us Dr. Elizabeth Harris. I do hope that I will not cause her undue embarrassment <laughs> when I say that her research profile and her academic background is indeed impressive. <coughs> Dr. Elizabeth Harris is currently a senior lecturer at uh, Liverpool Hope University, uh, formerly uh, she was a senior lecturer at the Birmingham University. In both cases she taught Buddhism in the Religious Studies Department. Dr. Elizabeth Harris studied Buddhism in Sri Lanka from 1986 to 1993 and obtained a PhD degree from the Postgraduate Institute of Pali and Buddhist Studies, University of Calabria. She was formerly Secretary for Interfaith Religions in the Methodist Church in London. <coughs> now, <coughs> uh, she is a senior research fellow uh, in the Cadbury Center for the Public Understanding of Religions at the University of Birmingham. She is the author of many publications, including what Buddhists believe, Buddhism for a violent world, 
Theravada Buddhism and the British encounter religious missionary and uh, colonial experience in 19th century Sri Lanka. Cambodian Buddhism history and practice. I should like to mention a remarkable quality of Dr. Harris. She is a committed Christian and follows the Methodist path. Yet she has spent so much time studying the Buddhism, Buddhist path, and she is very highly qualified to write and speak about Buddhist subjects. It is very rare to find someone so well qualified in such a diverse field. <clears throat> she has written an article about Buddhism in the West. Considering all these matters, we are very fortunate to have this scholar to deliver our Dharmapala Memorial Talk on the occasion of the 153rd birth anniversary of Anagarika Dharmapala. I would like to welcome our speaker and I would like to welcome our distinguished guest, including uh, Amari, Mrs. Amari Vijavadana, the High Commissioner for Sri Lanka, and Dr. Desmond Bedal, the Chairman of the Buddhist Society, and members of the Bihar Management Committee, and all of you are very welcome. Today the topic is Early Buddhist Pioneers Bringing Buddhism to the West. Thank you. that Buddhism has become a very important part of me. So I can't really say, well, I'm totally Christian. Buddhism is part of me. Um, so venerable members of the Mahasangha, honored guests, the Honorable High Commissioner, um, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great privilege um, to have been asked to give this memorial lecture on your Founders Day on the, according to your website, the 153rd birthday of Anagarika Dhammapala, and to give it at this most significant Vihara, where in 1986 I was blessed by Venerable Savitissa before I went to Sri Lanka. Um, so, I begin on a personal note. For about 20 years I've research into the encounter between Buddhism in Sri Lanka and the West. And I feel very close to some of the pioneers I'm going to mention. And um, so I'm going to share with you a personal journey um, into some of these people's writings and lives. And I'm creating a, li a lineage of influence um, of influence from one person to the other, and concentrating on Theravada Buddhism. First of all, I thought I would add um, D.T. Suzuki and some of the Japanese um, people who have come um, to the West. There is some, is some wonderful research being done on um, people who came in the, at the end of the 19th century from Japan, but I realized there just simply would not be time. So, um, I'm going to concentrate on these four people, some of whom will be very well known to you. Um, Edwin Arnold, um, some of you might say, well, he wasn't exactly a Buddhist, was he? Well, Anagarika Dhammapala, when he was in Britain before he went to the Parliament of the World's Religions, wrote in his diary that Arnold said he believed in reincarnation and other Buddhist principles, and some people have um, wondered whether he really was a Buddhist, but never would say it publicly, because that might have prevented him, but well, he wanted to become Poet Laureate. Um, and some people have, con have wondered whether he did not say he was Buddhist because of that. <coughs> I'm including him. Edwin Arnold, Frank Woodward, um, a theosophist who spent many years in Sri Lanka and then went to Australia, um, and so on. And of course, Anagarika Dhammapala. And then lastly, Alan Bennett, Ananda Maitreya, I've spoken about him um, at the Sri Sajatissa Centre in Kingsbury. I don't think I've spoken about him here. 
Um, but those are the four. Now, the date of publication of Edwin Arnold's famous poem, um, The Light of Asia, was 1879. So just fixing that date, if you had been um, living in the United Kingdom in 1879, there would have been few Pali texts which you could have accessed in, in translation. There was Vigo Faustball's Dhammapada, um, which was published in 1855. Um, and there were the translations of the Wesleyan Methodist missionary, um, Daniel Gogoli. He started translating Buddhist texts in the, the 1830s um, and continued to translate in the 1840s, but they were mainly published in Sri Lanka. He was most definitely a pioneer, but you probably didn't, wouldn't have known about that if you'd been living in Britain. And in 1879, you would perhaps been aware of several different representations of Buddhism. One strand would have said, well, Buddhism is nihilistic, it's pessimistic, Nirvana is annihilation, um, and so on. That would have been the evangelical missionary representation. And then some of the people who've been to Asia might have said, well, I think it's all very unscientific, a bit irrational, um, and so on. That might have been another strand. Um, there was another Wesleyan missionary, um, Robert Spence Hardy, who published a tremendously large compendium on Buddhism called the Manual of Buddhism in 1853. And he translated from many Sinhala texts and gives the whole biography of the Buddha. But his aim was to show the irrationality of Buddhism by um, kind of showing all these narratives. Then there would have been others who would have perhaps given a more exotic, romantic picture of Buddhism. Um, not really very factual, but very romantic. And only a few in 1879 would have been saying that Buddhism was an ethical philosophy, a rational philosophy. Um, Robert Childers, Childers's dictionary, Pali English dictionary, would have been published just four years before. And that was a very scholarly piece of work. So, um, and there were no clear, as it were, line. What was needed, this is my view, was um, accounts of Buddhism that communicated Buddhism as practiced positively. Yes, the evangelical missionaries would have tried to communicate this, but again, it would have been very pessimistic. They spoke about devil dancing and this kind of thing, and the demonic. So, no. But other ways of communicating Buddhism as practiced positively. A recreation of the Buddha, Buddha biography that was positive, um, and also a representation that presented the Buddha Dharma as relevant to the West. And I think <coughs> the people that I am talking about now did this if taken, if taken together. Um, so going to Edwin Arnold, yes, he was born in 1832, so that means when he went to India in, I should, can you hear me, actually, if I, can you hear me at the back? Because I just realized this isn't picking me up all the time. Um, yes, born in 1832, so that means he was only 24 when he went to India and became you know, head of the government Sanskrit college at Pune. And um, he spent several years there. He learned Sanskrit, gained a tremendous love of Buddhist literature, and I think the world of religion in general. And returns to the UK, um, goes into journalism, certainly retains a link with Asia, um, comes back to Sri Lanka, or comes to Sri Lanka in 1886. And almost in the same year, he um, initiates the campaign to um, rest control of Buddhist pilgrimage sites in India back to Buddhists. And of course, you will know that Anagarika Dharmapala spends much of his life also on, on this project. And then he publishes The Light of Asia in 1879. And it went into numerous editions. And why was it so, so popular? I think it fed into a Victorian yearning for alternative spiritualities. 
Um, some modern researchers talk about seekership now, you know, the, those who are seeking. Well, certainly in Victorian Britain, there were a lot of people who were seeking for something more than the established church, the Christian church. They were willing to be open to new worlds, especially you know, as the British Empire was, was opening up. So yes, it fed a yearning, and certainly an appeal to the emotions. How many of you have read The Light of Asia? Pretty sure quite a few. I know some of my, my friends in trip, yeah, a few hands are going up, yes, yeah, some have read The Light of Asia. Yeah, it appealed to the emotions and was written with absolute conviction. It kind of shines through the words of the poem. And um, the Buddha is presented as a hero of compassion, really embodying the most loved human qualities. And it has a very dramatic feel to it. Um, so, and also Arnold presents quite a romantically appealing version of the Four Noble Truths. So you get a heady mixture of romance, heroism, compassion, and absolute goodness combined. And so I'm giving a few um, extracts from um, The Light of Asia. And there are a lot of extracts in this presentation. This is at the point when um, Prince Zata has seen the third sight, the a corpse. And according to Arnold, but lo, Siddhartha turned, eyes gleaming with divine tears to the sky, eyes lit with heavenly pity to the earth. From sky to earth he looked, from earth to sky, as if his spirit sought in lonely flight some far-off vision, linking this and that, lost, past, but searchable, but seen, but known. Then cried he, while his lifted countenance glowed with the burning passion of a love unspeakable, the ardor of a hope boundless, unsatiate, O oh, suffering world, O oh, known and unknown of my common flesh, caught in this common net of death and woe, and life which binds to both, I see, I feel the vastness of the agony of earth. Do you see how attractive that kind of um, poetry is. Yes, it's a bit flowery, it's a bit Victorian, but yes, um, yes, that, I'm going to go back because, um, to that one, um, or this bit. He's seeing the noble truths, and this is in the sixth book towards the end, because most of the poem is about his actual renunciation. The subtitle is The Great Renunciation, and so, this is him, as it were, seeing the first noble truth. How sorrow is shadow to life, moving where life doth move, not to be laid aside until one lays living aside with all its changing states. Birth, growth, decay, love, hatred, pleasure, pain, being and doing. How that none strips off these sad delights and pleasant griefs who lacks knowledge to know them snares. But he who knows avidya, delusion, sets these snares, loves life no longer, but ensues escape. So, yeah. Why was it popular? Well, there was some doctrine in the, the Light of Asia. Um, the person of the Buddha, I think, becomes doctrine. The Buddha's compassion, the social concern, um, because at one point in the poem, the, the Buddha is seen um, speaking and honouring a Dalit, what we would call a Dalit today, those outside the, the Brahminical caste system. So the Buddha himself embodies doctrine in the poem. As for an anatta, well, the poem talks about a false self rather than no self. We all, all have a false self which feeds our selfishness. Karma becomes central to the poem a karma that makes us what we are. Um, we make our minds to our karma. Nibbana, various similes come across, one of which is closer to Hinduism than Buddhism, about a, a dewdrop slipping into the ocean. But it's, it's seen as positive, that's the main thing, and a mystery. Arnold says a little about meditation. There's something in at one point, he says, well, that's for the renunciants. That's, that's not for ordinary people. Um, 
others who I'm talking about later say much more. So that's Arnold. And then the lineage. I would say Arnold's poem was the most important influence on many who turned to Buddhism at that, in that last part of the 19th century. And the context of Britain, again, was um, a society where there were quite a few what we would call today new religious movements, NRMs. Um, yes, there was those who were drawn to spiritualism. There was the Order of the Golden Dawn that emerged, which went into esotericism and magic and, and that kind of thing. There, and then, of course, there was the Theos Theosophical Society, formed in 1875 by Olcott and um, Henry Seal Olcott and Helena Blavatsky. And, of course, the Theosophical Society at first really sought to um, put new life into spiritualism. It was not about Buddhism at all. But after Blavatsky wrote Isis Unveiled in um, 1880, and the Theosophists began to see that the wisdom they felt lay behind all religions could be found in the East, and they looked to Buddhism. I also think that perhaps Arnold's poem also influenced them. So I'm going to Frank Lee Woodward now, and you may not have heard of Frank Lee Woodward, but I think he's worthy of of honor today. Um, <coughs> son of a Christian clergyman, as I'm a daughter of a Christian clergyman. Um, he studied classics at Cambridge. He became a teacher. 1902, he joined the Theosophical Society and eventually offer, he meets Olcott and he, he offers himself to Olcott. He says, Olcott, what do you want me to do? I want to be part of this. Um, and of course, Olcott sends him to Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka, and he stays there 17 years, um, and I think he becomes more Buddhist than Theosophist. He becomes head of um, Mahinda College in Gaul, and deeply embeds himself in the Buddhist culture of Gaul, and creates very good relationships with the monastic Sangha, such that when he actually leaves, the monastic Sangha go and bid him farewell. And that was quite an unusual thing at that time for, for the Mahasangha to honor, um, certainly a Westerner, um, a head of a Buddhist school. Um, so, and that experience in Sri Lanka created a great empathy between him and the, the actual practice of Buddhism on the ground. You know, what you do in this vihara on Poya days, and this kind of what happens in, in um, every vihara in, in Sri Lanka. But after um, RTV Sri Lanka, he goes to Australia and translates texts for the Pali Text Society. Um, if any of you have got any of the Pali Text Society book translations on your bookshelf, see if you can find some by Frank Woodward. I didn't have time to look. I have some of them. I'm sure he did some of the Anguita and the Kaya, but you might correct me there. Um, but um, so he was working with T.W. Rhys Davids, who founded the Pali Tech Society in 1881. And um, so I think influenced Buddhism in the West in a kind of two pronged way one, through the texts, and also through writings about lived Buddhism. Um, and I think I've said most of that. Um, yes, he certainly had sensitivity to the devotional side um, and to meditation. In his book, can I, yeah. this book here, Pictures of Buddhist Ceylon and Other Papers, there's one um, paper in which he is sitting under a tree in Gaul and is talking about meditation and the cobra that, that he shares his space with, and things like that. Um, it, it's really very beautiful. And he criticizes those from the West who think of Buddhism only as a rational philosophy. Because that was also a strand that was coming into the West. Buddhism is only a rational philosophy. It is a rational philosophy. Um, but it's also so much more. And people like Frank Wood would realize this when they were there among the people. Um, so, this is um, from one of the papers in this book, 
um, in which he's describing a typical Poya day in the Vihara in, in Gaul. And then he imagines someone in the West saying, but this is not Buddhism. And then this is his reply as printed in this book. Pure devotion, we make reply. Love for the brother of mankind, in other words, the Buddha, whose strong presence, like the subtle fragrance of a long closed jar of scent now opened, suffuses the world after so many hundred years. A presence that still may help in need whosoever thirsteth though he has forever passed away. Brothers, his dying words, I leave you the Dhamma. In it shall I live with you forever. Yes, he's speaking about a personal relationship there with the Dharma, with the Buddha, with the people of Sri Lanka. And, you know, communicated this in, in his writings. Now, to Anagarika Dharmapala. Now, I am sure um, there are people here who know far more about the Anagarika Dharmapala than I do. Um, but on one of my visits to Sri Lanka, I went to the Mahabodhi Society there and started reading his diaries. There's a copy of the complete set of the diaries there. And today, I'm going to concentrate on um, Dharmapala's first visit to the UK, when he, um, before he was going to the Parliament of the World's Religions in Chicago. And I've given you the, the cover there of a new biography of um, Anagarika Dhammapala by Sarath Amunagama called The Lion's Roar. And it gives a picture of Dhammapala when he was young. I mean, this is when he is um, slightly older, more venerable. This is when he is young, enthusiastic. Well, I'm sure he was enthusiastic then. He never lost that. But um, yes, the enthusiasm of youth. So um, yes, as you will know, born David Hedavitarana, educated in Christian schools. And that's apparent in his diaries because, um, yes, he uses sometimes Christian vocabulary and even quotes from the Bible in some of his diaries, although he was very critical of Christianity at the same time. Um, so, and he worked, as you know, with Olcott, who saw him almost as a son, and he sees Olcott as a father, but um, eventually there, there is a souring of that relationship. Um, and I would say Dharmapala was influenced by the West, but also had a great influence on the West. And one of the first entries in the diary that I read, a diary entry for March 5th, 1889, and at that point he's in Japan with Olcott, and he writes, reading the light of Asia, wherein I found consolation and hope. The life of my dear Lord is enough to give consolation and emulations to anyone who wishes to follow this noble law. So, Looking back to Arnold, and of course, Arnold inspires his campaign in India and becomes a great friend. And as I said, he, his first visit to the UK is when he is traveling to the Parliament of the World's Religions in 1893. And he writes in his diary that in February 1893, Alcott strongly disapproves of him going to Chicago. That doesn't stop him. He doesn't say why, and that certainly doesn't stop him from going. Um, because by August 1893, he's in the UK. And this is what he writes in his diary. Had a glimpse of the distant land, in other words, Britain, and I contemplated of the future of Buddhism and England. England has a duty to perform in consolidating the Buddhist nations which no other nation could. I wonder if Britain has done that. Um, and claims he has a great feeling of affection for Britain. <coughs> what does he do? Well, in the UK, he meets several times with Edwin Arnold, and he speaks about how kind he is. He meets with the Leadbeaters. Now, C. W. Charles W. Leadbeater was a theosophist who spent several years in Sri Lanka, and 
edited the first volume of the Buddhist, which um, is the English journal um, of the Buddhist Theosophical Society in, um, in Colombo. And um, so, yeah, he meets with the Lead Beaters, he meets with T.W. Rhys Davids and tries to persuade him to support the work in India. And Rhys Davids said he will. He goes with Edwin Arnold to Lord Kimberley, Secretary of State for India, again about the temple in Bodh Gaya and the need for Bodh Gaya to be brought back into Buddhist hands. He meets Annie Besant, who, as it were, takes over the leadership of the Theosophical Society um, after Olcott and you know, Blavatsky, and says you know, that Besant is as kind as my mother. He's also introduced the clairvoyance. He goes to a spiritualist um, meeting and um, talks about someone seeing the aura of the Buddha. Yes, this was the kind of atmosphere in London at the time. You know, spiritualism was around and, um, and this kind of thing. <coughs> so, I think that on this visit in the UK, his main concern is the Mahabodhi Society and India, the struggle in India. And it becomes quite a complicated legal struggle, of course. And, um, but he's evidently talking to people about Buddhism, and he speaks to Arnold and Rhys Davids about it. Um, Arnold tells him he believes in reincarnation. According to his diary, Rhys Davids declares himself a Buddhist. Um, and again, publicly, Rhys Davids never did this. I, in another book I wrote, I've quoted something else that Rhys Davids said, where he, he kind of skirts around the issue. Are you a Christian? Are you a Buddhist? Said, well, of course, the established church and all that. But, um, yeah. He, um, so he's, <coughs> Anagarika Dhanapala is speaking to people about Buddhism. He's enthusiastic <coughs> about Britain. He names at least ten people when he says good, that he says goodbye to before he sails from Southampton for the, the USA. And it's in the USA, of course, that um, Anagarika Dharmapala really feels he can um, speak about Buddhism to others, that he's got a mission, he's got a mission to persuade those there of the superiority of Buddhism. Um, and so this is him writing on, on an entry the 11th and 12th of September 1983, a historic day in the, in, in the religious evolution all spoke of God, and this was at the Parliament, and I was the last to speak at the morning sessions. I got the impulse at the moment and I spoke. Truth, justice, and love and charity are powerful weapons in the hands of the altruist. Reception in the evening at Mr. Bartlett's, all smiling faces, and to all I spoke and gave my good wishes and peace. Some liken me to Christ, and he's put three exclamation marks after that. Ah, the divine compassion of the Buddha, with only one exclamation mark after. <laughs> the great difference between him and the other great teachers is that he takes all living beings under his compassion. So, but he speaks again, and this is his entry for the 18th of September. It is the dawn of a new era for us. All expect to hear my paper, and may it show the world that there is light in Buddhism, more light that in, than in any other system. And when he gives it, he calls on the gods to hear Buddha. So what is his message in this particular um, speech that he gives? And I'm using um, a compendium of speeches from the parliament that I've got at home. He quotes Arnold at the beginning of one of his presentations. Arnold saying the Buddha is savior and teacher. He stresses the wisdom and compassion of the Buddha. He interprets the Dharma as philosophical religion. And yes, again, he uses some <coughs> Christianized vocabulary. Sin, redeemer, savior. Perhaps it's because he knows he's speaking to a majority Christian organ or audience. He summarizes the Four Noble Truths. He quotes from the Pali texts. And this is one sample. Now I'm going to read another one. To be born as a human is a glorious privilege. Man's dignity consists in his capability to reason. 
and think and to live up to the highest ideal of pure life, of calm thought, of wisdom without extraneous intervention. In the Samanathala Sutta, and I've used the spelling in my source, it's not the right spelling. In the Samanathala Sutta, Buddha says that man can enjoy in this life a glorious existence, a life of individual freedom, of fearlessness and compassionateness. This dignified ideal of manhood may be attained by the humblest, and this consummation raises him above wealth and royalty. He that is compassionate and observes the law is my disciple, says the Buddha. And this is another bit from that presentation. Just to imagine you were there um, at this parliament, which is a tremendously um, you know, groundbreaking event in 1893 in Chicago. You have Vivekananda is sit, you know, sits quite, perhaps close to um, um, Anagarika Dhammapala. And eventually, Buddhists from Japan come and speak about Mahayana Buddhism. Um, Anagarika Dhammapala is the only one representing Theravada Buddhism. So he says this, um, in the religion of Buddha is found a comprehensive system of ethics and a transcendental metaphysic embracing a sublime psychology. To the simple-minded, it offers a code of morality. To the earnest student, a system of pure thought. But the basic doctrine is the self-purification of man. Spiritual progress is impossible for him who does not lead a life of purity and compassion. The rays of the sunlight of truth enter the mind of him who is fearless to examine truth, who is free from prejudice, who is not tied by the sensual passions, and who has reasoning faculties to think. One has to be an atheist in the sense employed by Max Muller. There is an atheism which is unto, de unto death. There is another which is the very lifeblood of all truth and faith. It is the power of giving up what in our best, our most honest moments we know to be no longer true. It is the readiness to replace the less perfect, however dear, however sacred it may have been to us, by the more perfect, however much it may be death detested as yet by the world. It is the truth of self-surrender, the true self-sacrifice, the truest trust in truth, the truest faith and so on. That's him at the Parliament of the World's Religions. No wonder he made such a tremendous impression there. On his in his diary on the way back, I was quite priced, surprised to see this actually, and he lectures on, um, on the Oceanic, that's the name of the ship he's on. Um, so he says, lecture in the evening, subject all religions, to the passengers on board the Oceanic. Mr. Green presided. When asked whether Christianity is sufficient for the people of Europe and America, I answer that if people live up to the teachings of Jesus Christ, no other religion was necessary. Sir Dharmapala rarely seen since his experience of Christianity in Sri Lanka was just so, so negative. And it's the... Um, and generally speaking, his idea of the Christian God, according to his writings, and I read a lot of them, that Christianity is violent, destructive, and the Christian God capricious. So, yes, Dharmapala's message. Yes, Buddhism as a rational <coughs> and life-giving philosophy, as ethical and humane and as non-exclusivist. And here again, he is he um, contests what he sees as the exclusivism of Christianity, something which I think has to be contested and which Dharmapala did very well. Um, the non-exclusivism, the compassion of Buddhism, prioritizing compassion, and always saying, yes, this is superior to theistic religions, and that Buddhism is essentially non-destructive, in one article, which some of you may know, it's, it's in Gurugay's collection, he kind of divides um, religions between the destructive and non-destructive. And in the non-destructive, the only religion he places there are Buddhism, Jainism, and some forms of Hinduism. So, a glimpse into the young Anagarika Dharmapala. Um, a glimpse that often we don't get. Um, 
to my last person briefly, because I know I started a little late, but if I go on to about six, is that okay? Um, Alan Bennett. Um, many, many years ago, I um, wrote this little pamphlet on Alan Bennett, which was published by the um, the wheel publicate by the well, the wheel publication of the Buddhist Publication Society in Sri Lanka. Now I'm working with an American scholar to do a much longer biography of Alan Bennett, Ananda Maitreya, and an edited collection of his writings because I think he's such a significant person. There you have um, pictures of almost the two sides of his life: Ananda Maitreya in London before he became a Buddhist monk and pictures of him as a Buddhist monk. So, key points in this, this person's life. Born in 1872 to Catholic parents, but his father dies when young, <coughs> and he um, lets go of any Roman Catholicism he had quite early in his life. Develops an interest in science, and takes jobs which involve scientific thinking, and He's, a, he's another seeker. He reads The Light of Asia quite early on in his life, I think when he's about 18. Um, and he, so he's exploring Eastern spirituality, Buddhism among many other things. He joins the Brixton Lodge of the Theosophical <coughs> Society in 1893, and also this other new religious movement, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. He becomes known as someone who can Yes, as someone who is a bit of a magician, um, who can do quite a few remarkable things with a wand. And because of his link with magic, esotericism, some early Buddhists in Britain um, almost tried to keep him at arm's length because he, he was someone who was just fascinated by spirituality and the spirituality <coughs> of his day. Um, and he also becomes friends with Alistair Crowley, who in his life becomes quite a not notorious figure because he goes towards things like Satanism. Um, but Alistair Crowley sends um, Alan Bennett to Sri Lanka in 1900 because he hopes this will help cure his asthma. Because one thing about Alan Bennett is that he is not, he was never um, a, a well man. He suffered from chronic asthma the whole of his life and um, had to take what was prescribed at that time for asthma drugs such as opium and others, which again might have made him appear a little bit spaced out at certain times, you know, but that was the drugs prescribed for his, his asthma. Um, so, yes, he gets to Sri Lanka. He learns Pali in Sri Lanka and he develops an interest in meditation, not only Buddhist meditation, he also is taught by Hindus as well. But he eventually realizes that his future life lies in Buddhism. And I see him as moving away from a kind of esotericism, a kind of interest in magic, to a realization that you know, Buddhism is, is his path. And, um, but he's told or comes to the conclusion that Buddhism in <coughs> Burma, or Myanmar as it is now, um, is purer than Buddhism in Sri Lanka. So he goes off to Myanmar and um, receive novice ordination and then higher ordination. Um, in 1902, he forms the Buddhasasana Samagama, the International Buddhist Society, and there he really has an international vision. He wants to, from Myanmar, reach Europe, the West. He starts an illustrated quarterly called Buddhism, and that is sent to many libraries in the West, on condition that they leave it on the table so that it's, um, it's there for everyone to read. And if they do that, then they get a free copy. Um, if they hide it away in the library, then they, I don't know how he knew whether they put it on the table, but anyway, um, that, was his, and that was his condition. And then in 1908, he leads a mission to Britain. Now, um, that's sometimes considered to be the first Buddhist mission to Britain, but um, I don't think strictly it was. Um, there was a Japanese mission in the 1890s, and of course, Anagarika Dharmapala um, you know, went, came to Britain on a mission much earlier. Um, but in 1908, he comes with some Burmese colleagues and some of his patrons, um, and is hosted by the very new 
the Buddhist Society for Great Britain and Ireland, which was really created for his arrival. And, um, but he doesn't stay in Britain all that long, returns to Burma, remains there until 1914, by which time he is disrobed, I think because he could not keep um, the Vinaya because his asthma was returning and this kind of thing. And then he returns to Britain in 1914 and stays there, stays here until his death. Um, so why choose Alan Bennett? What is it about him? I know when I first read his writings, and I can remember when I did it, it was in the Buddhist Publication Society in Sri Lanka, in Kandy, and they have one of his published collections of articles. I thought, wow, this stuff is amazing. He's, he's writing in such a, such a vivid way. Um, what have we got from him? We've got invocations and things from his, from the, from his time from the Golden Dawn, we have two collections of his articles on Buddhism, um, The Wisdom of the Aryas, published in 1923, the year of his death, The Religion of Burma and Other Papers, which was published later, but some of the papers were available earlier. There are lengthy articles in the Buddhist, and the Buddhist Society here in, in London has the whole set of, of, um, of journals there. They're all there. I read them there. Um, and very, very impactful articles, the faith of the, pu the future, the law of righteousness, the new civilization, Nibbana. Then there were addresses published in the Buddhist Review and in the Theosophist, pamphlets pu published by his organization in Myanmar, addresses published independently. A tremendous amount out there. I'm going to give you a few examples again of his writings and just see if you agree with me. Would you have got the same wow factor as I did when I first read them? But, um, oh no, first of all, there's another slide about um, his modes of writing. How did he write? Well, he was certainly very keen to contest misconceptions about Buddhism, whether it was theosophy's misconceptions, missionary misconceptions, um, misconceptions of people who felt that Buddhism was just a philosophy and not a kind of total way of, of living. He contested that. He offered a representation of Buddhism that stressed, the op stressed opposition to individualistic greed, um, and certainly a Buddhism that stressed meditation. Ananda Meitaya was a meditator. You get far more on meditation in Ananda Meitaya than you do, I think, in Anagarika Dhammapala or um, in um, Edwin Arnold or any of those I've mentioned so far. He's engaging with the debate about science and religion. He engages with politics, economics, social issues. And he preaches to the West, which he sees as becoming far too individualistic, materialistic, and so on. And there's a great poetry to his writing. So um, this is one part, part of the faith of the future. If you aspire to lighten the burden of the world, to bring humanity a little nearer to the peace it craves. Start right at home and strive to free, to ennoble, to purify yourself, your own life, your heart's aspirations. And why? Because each man is an integral portion of humanity. Because each thought of love, each effort after purity man makes or thinks is gain to all because it is but the illusion binding us that bids us think, I am one soul, one mind, one life, and these my brothers are without and separate from me. All life is one in very truth, the ant and man, glory of sun and star, and the vast gulfs of space are one, one and no other, save that the darkness of our, of our vain selfhood hides. Yeah, that's what he's saying. Um, now, do you think this? No. There's that one. Do you think this is stream entry? Tell me. Um, as from the heart of a dark thundercloud at night time, when but naught or but little of earth or heaven can be seen, suddenly the lightning flashes, and for an instant the unseen world gleams forth in instantaneous light light penetrating every darkest corner, flushing the clouded sky with momentary glory. 
So then, at that great moment, will come the realization of all our toil. No words, no similes, no highest thought of ours can adequately convey that mighty realization. But then, at that time, we shall know and see. We shall realize that all our life has changed of a sudden. And what of yore we deemed compassion? What of old we deemed the utmost attainment that our mind or the life of man can compass? That is ours at last. We have won, achieved, and entered into the path of which mere words can never tell. Yeah, that's him writing in Burma and other papers. And just got a couple more quotes, and I'm going to finish fairly soon. Um, and here he's, it's the social criticism side of Ananda Maitreya. The criticism that could say, look what's happening in Britain. You know, Britain has not got it right. Um, Burma has. Apart altogether from the misery that that civilization has spread in lands beyond its pale, in other words, Britain, can it be claimed that in its in internal polity, that for its own peoples, it has brought with it any diminution of the world's suffering, any diminution of its degradation, its misery, its crime? Above all, has it brought about any general increase of its native contentment, the extension of any such knowledge as promotes the spirit of mutual helpfulness rather than the curse of competition? Has it brought to the peoples of the West a lasting increase of mental peace, of solidarity, of deep and enduring happiness? And his answer is no. He was quite a critic of British imperialism and the kind of superiority that they took towards the people of Myanmar where he was. And the other quotes he speaks about the overflowing jails in Britain, the, um, the well, the unhappiness in Britain and the inequality between rich and poor. This is him countering misconceptions. <coughs> misconceptions about Buddhism. Firstly, that Buddhism is a heathen doctrine whose adherents worship idols and pray to stone and wood. Secondly, that it is a mysterious sort of affair connected with miracle mongering and esotericism. And he contests that one as well, which sometimes the theosophists were guilty of going towards. So although he kept in contact with the theosophists all his life, he also criticized their kind of construction of Buddhism. Thirdly, that it is a backboneless, apathetic, pessimistic in, um, manner of philosophy with annihilation as its goal and aim, tending to the subversion of all useful activities and enough for the dreamy peoples for the, of the Orient as those who know them least delight in calling them. And again, he contests that which the missionaries were sometimes um, putting forward. So what is his <coughs> legacy? If we're talking about um, early Buddhists who are bringing Buddhism to the West. On his mission in 1908, some would say it was not a fantastic success. He wasn't a great public speaker. He tend, according to the records, he looked down a bit. Um, and he was, he was, after all, a Buddhist monk, and he may have used a fan and, um, and so on and looked down. Um, but he made some converts. Francis Payne, who wrote um, prolifically about Buddhism, was a convert of Ananda Maitreya. And I think his writings live on and can still speak. And I hope when we get an edited version of some of his writings, that will be obvious. But he was controversial, particularly of his link with those who, involve, who were involved in esotericism. And he's also a mirror, I think, on the spirituality of Victor late Victorian, early 20th century. So my concluding thoughts, my concluding side. Um, I think the four I've concentrated on presented new lights on Buddhism to the West. Um, you've got the Buddha as hero of compassion, as an enlightened person who embodies his teaching. Buddhist devotion as peaceful, beautiful, non-violent. The Dhamma as rational and life-giving. Meditation as the path towards compassion, and I'm thinking particularly of Ananda Maitreya there. So I would say let us honor all of them today on our Founders Day and the Garaka Dhammapala, and the ones who are also in the same lineage as him.